It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Paul Herzog. You can see that he's a director uh, of the uh, Center for Innate Immunity and Infectious Diseases, and, and you know that I like to keep my introduction short. So that's as much uh, information as you're going to get from me, except for the fact that uh, Paul is also a, a founder of the Victorian Infection and Innate Immunity uh, set of meetings, I think they are. <laughs> Uh, and they're really geared towards students and postdocs, which, which uh, means you. And they're, they're great events to, to come along to, great events to uh, get a chance to present your data in front of a reasonably large crowd and, and get some important feedback. So I can recommend those. And I can recommend this great talk on interferon signaling from Paul. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'm... Uh very flattered to have uh, an invitation to come to this series, which I must say I've eyed off with uh, envy from afar, and I, I wish it was uh, replicated in many places. I think you students are fortunate to have a forum where, look, I, I've looked at the series of what you've had so far and what's about to come in, in, uh, in our field of innate immunity and inflammation. It's, you, you've got a great group of speakers. So today I'll, uh, I'll focus on interferon and, and uh, interferon signaling, which is what I like to work on. Um, if I've got the pitch right, it's, uh, it's a bit of a general overview of the field. I'll take you through a somewhat of a historical perspective and inject uh, a little bit of our work along the way. Um, so I, I thought from, I'd go very basics, and the focus will be interferon as, a, as an important molecule in innate Im immune response, the very first and primary response. A little bit of history, talk about what the interferons are and their definition to make sure we're on the same page, talk a little bit about the regulation of their production and their action, and towards the end, some of our, our published data, I, I guess, on, uh, on its role in disease. So in, interferons, to, to push the barrow, have, have played an important part in, in cytokine history for, for many reasons. They were, they were one of the first cytokines cloned, sorry, um, back in 1957, and we, some of us contributed to a really nice uh, addition of cytokine and growth factor reviews last year, and in that Nick Nicola wrote a really nice overview of the history of cytokines and pointed out that I, Alec Isaacs started his work on viral interference, which uh, defined this about seven years before this final discovery, here at Weehi, actually. Um, Interferon beta uh, by Taniguchi was one of the first cytokines cloned. Uh, it was very early injected into clinical application, maybe a bit, uh, a bit too early, because it, it preceded by 15 years the cloning of pure recombinant proteins. So <coughs> these were actually concoction and mixtures that, that people were getting in the early days, but still didn't daunt some of the progress uh, that, that, that occurred in that. Um, the regulation of gene expression in, in broad terms by Tom Maniatis, who used the interferon enhancer and promoter as the model, really taught us a lot about gene regulation and how transcription factors work and integrate with the transcriptional regulation machinery. And of course, the JAK-STAT signaling pathway was discovered in the interferon system by both uh, Jim Darnell and George Stark and Ian Kerr. And I, I would refer everybody to, to some of these papers as really uh, really important ones in the field, particularly the, the story of the JAT stat signaling. I nearly did a journal club on it today, but I decided I wouldn't. But the, the approach by Darnell in those days was fairly heroic to identify protein complexes bound to DNA elements on the hypothesis that if there was specificity in cytokine signaling outside the cell, there had to be something inside the cell as well. This was complemented by George Stark and Ian Kerr, who had an expression cloning system, which was really elegant and took a broad genetic approach in a functional screen to identify factors that might be involved in, in regulating an interferon-inducible promoter. And in those days, this really took the idea of signaling, which is going to be the topic of the day, from a black box where a cytokine went in and, and a signal came out to really knowing specificity. And in fact, as far, again, as far as this institute goes, it, it was this sort of functional screen that I know inspired uh, Doug Hilton and Robin Starr and uh, Warren Alexander to undertake this, the functional screen that identified the SOX proteins, which are negative regulators. So you know, for the historical context, I think it's very important. The, as I said, interferon was discovered in the 
57, it's often attributed to, but in fact there was a report, although it wasn't named as much four years earlier by a Japanese group, but it's often attributed to Al Alan Isaacs and, and John Linderman. Very quickly rose to prominence in scientific journals and even made the cover of Time as a, as a potential big drug for cancer in those days due to its ability to both inhibit proliferation of cells and also to regulate the immune response. And it was discovered by you know, classic virologists who were looking at propagating viruses in eggs and noticed that you couldn't essentially reinfect an egg. And so he came to the conclusion that there was a, a substance or a factor called the interferon, as he named it, that, that, interfered, that was induced by viruses and interfered with subsequent viral infection. And from there, there, there are many years from a described uh, biological activity, if you like, through chemical procedures, it was worked out that there were not one type but multiple interferons. They were fractionated on, on protein uh, separation columns and by chemical stability and so forth. And it wasn't until, as I said, in the, in the 80s, essentially, that they were cloned and we knew exactly what they were. Um, if they were discovered these days, as I said, the interferons form an important part of the innate immune response. This very early response, which is evolutionary, quite ancient, uh, we've evolved it to sense all sorts of environmental stresses and stimuli, most famous in this system for pathogens, viruses and bacteria and so forth. And it's this early response that, that both uh, senses um, these danger signals, if you like, and orchestrates molecular and cellular events that are responsible for, you know, centuries old uh, traits of inflammation, the, the redness, the swelling, the heat that's due to influxes of cells, permeability of, of vessels and so forth. So the, as you've probably heard already in this series from previous speakers, the innate response is mediated by a, a series of sensors which over the last 10 or 12 years has changed our perception of innate immunity from being somewhat not non-specific. To have at least some order and sensitivity in these hundreds of receptors that belong to the TLR, the, re, the NOD family, C-type lectins and so forth. In, uh, in mammals, we, we, in, at least with the TLR family, there are about 13 of them. They, some of them sit on the cell surface where they sense the outside of pathogens. Some of them sit inside the cell in endosomes where they sense intracellular components of pathogens, particularly DNA and RNA in its various forms that may be existent uh, in, inherently in these pathogens or may be metabolized to different byproducts that can be sensed. This system is, is, is very anciently preserved, at least the toll-like receptor system and the sensing system. So in a very simple organism like a sea urchin, in fact, they have 200 toll-like receptors. They have, they have 50 or so um, nod-like receptors. They have 20 or 30 members of the ENF kappa B signaling pathway. So this shows the importance, you know, through evolution of having an innate system that, that, that senses danger and responds to it. In simple organisms, however, all you need is a signaling system inside the cell that's going to activate uh, uh, molecules that, that, that are protective and so forth. But in multicellular or organisms, where, when this broad number of, of sensors basically honed down to, to smaller numbers, th this occurred in vertebrates when uh, organisms become multicellular and then what you needed was secondary signals and extracellular molecules to be produced to communicate between cells. And this is really where the idea of effector molecules and cytokines came in. So what's drawn here is a, in fact a TLR4 response to LPS, but in some ways the fact that there is a sensor, adapter molecules, enzymes, transcription factors and genes programs is pretty uh, generic for all of these signaling systems. Two of the major and certainly best characterized systems from innate sensors are the induction of NF kappa B and what's called classic pro inflammatory cytokines like IL 6 TNF, et cetera, and also the activation of either TBK or IKK epsilon kinases, particularly the IRF family of transcription factor, which, which drive interferons. And it's these. Uh, major and important sensors of the innate system that I'll talk about today. But also just to point out, and I'm not going to deal with it much as I, as I go through my talk, 
that it's not only the innate system where cytokines like interferons work at the very primary site of an insult or an infection, but they really are the, the linkers that shape and sculpt the ensuing uh, cells of the adaptive immune response and, and tone and tune uh, their, their efficacy. Okay, so to go through some basics and, and just uh, make sure you know what interferons are. These days we classify them into three types, type one, which uh, I mainly work on, uh, which include multiple interferon alpha genes, interferon beta, uh, epsilon, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, type two, which is a single interferon gamma, and type three, which is interferon lambda, also called IL-2829 uh, in, in some forums, but I think this is the favoured nomenclature. So, th so these types of interferon then, uh, they're all interferon because they all have antiviral activity, they have some common signalling mechanism which I'll go into, but they're distinct, uh, distinct and separated and classified by the fact that um, particularly they have very specific receptors. Um, they're within, within a type, their amino acid sequence has some similarity and they're distinct then between types and often they're produced by different cells in response to different circumstances, although again there's some commonality in that as well. So a really brief summary then, for example, the type 1 interferons are mainly induced by pathogens. Um, they're produced by, they can be produced by all cells and they signal through two receptors called IFNA1 and 2. I've classified this as an alpha chain, so in nomenclature we use in cytokines, the alpha chain is the primary binding chain which usually can engage ligand by itself and then when a beta chain comes in the affinity increases and you get uh, most of the signalling then from the ternary complex. With gamma as you can see two distinct receptors, gamma actually eight, acts as a homodimer, touches only two molecules of GR1 and the other receptor comes in as an accessory signalling molecule. An interferon lambda have, has a specific alpha chain called lambda R1 and uses the beta chain of the IL-10 receptor as its main signalling. As you can see, they all signal through JAK-STAT signaling pathway, which I'll go through a little bit. Uh, classically, uh, with type 1 interferons, it's, it's TIC2 and JAK1 and STAT1 and 2 in a complex called the ISGF3, which is also very similar to lambda, which therefore induces a lot of similar responses. Uh, gamma has different JAK kinases and tends to signal through STAT1 and 3 homodimers, but, but there's a lot of degeneracy amongst that, in fact. As I said, they all have antiviral activity, the potency varies a little bit and they all uh, have the ability to activate uh, or suppress at times some of the immune cells and their responses. So I'll, I'll focus mainly, as I said, on the type ones today. So as I said, these molecules were cloned around the early 80s. The first one was beta by Taniguchi uh, group. It, it was really uh, some of the forerunners that, that launched the biotechnology boom in those days and many of the, the start-up biotech companies of the time had interferons as one of their primary products. So these, uh, these genes are 160, so the proteins are 106 amino acids, they're encoded by a gene with no introns, very, very simple units. And, if, and, and now, uh, with the advent of cloning and human DNA sequences, we can, we can look at the locus which looks like this. So the type 1 interferons are all clustered in one locus. In the mouse, it's chromosome 4p. Human, it's 9p near the INC4 tumor suppressor locus. The black arrows here represent coding genes. The others are shooter genes. As you can see, the, the locus is like an inverted repeat. There's a series of alphas. Uh, there's an interferon beta at one end up there, it's hard to see from here, and an interferon epsilon at the end, which I'll, I'll mention the, these fairly briefly. But this, this typifies, the fact that you've got coding genes, pseudo genes, it typifies what you might see as a snapshot of evolutionary time where some of these genes are coming in and out of existence. And even if you look at SNPs and, and that in human populations these days, you can get some diversity in which genes are operational and which ones aren't. So as far as production of these genes, they're generally made in small subsets. You never get all of them, you very rarely, and I'll tell you the exception, get one of them. They're induced by pathogens, those viruses and bacteria, even though they're more famous for their role in viral infections. They're also induced by commensals, so lactobacillus, for example, is a really strong stimulus for um, interferon beta production in the gut. They're also induced by damps, so DNA from damaged cells can often uh, mimic 
the appearance of viral DNA. There are human diseases such as Akati Gutierrez syndrome where the inability to break down uh, DNA from dying cells generates PAMPs that activate an interferon response and is, is pathogenic in the disease scenario. There are also a couple of examples, and I'm sure there are many more, of what I would call physiological production of type 1 interferon. So one example is MCSF, which stimulates the production of interferon beta during the differentiation of macrophages. Uh, another one is rank ligand, which stimulates the production of interferon beta in the transition from macrophages to the production of osteoclasts. So in, in mice, for example, that can't respond to interferons like IFNA knockout mice, which we've made, you see some abnormalities in hemopoietic stem cells and also they're slightly osteopenic because of the... Um, because of the effects on osteoclast generation. So, begs the question then is why on earth do we have so many of these type 1 interferons? Uh, this is a phylogenetic tree that shows the relationship between these alpha interferons. I think my point is dead, but you can imagine down the right hand side. So, the uh, identity of these alpha family is between um, 78 and 100% you know, identical. Um, so on the top right, you can see there that alpha-1 and alpha-13 genes, in fact, encode um, identical proteins. Down the bottom, you can see that... Um, I think the point... The, the change is working, but the point is not, is it? Yeah. Um, down the bottom there, you can see the genes epsilon, beta, et cetera, which are, their similarity is about 30%. But, however, they still all seem to work through the same receptor complex and generate fairly similar signals. Uh, so they all seem to wrap up like a, a alpha helical bundle cytokine with four or five bundles of helices and interact with, with the receptors in similar ways. The only differences really, particularly between these alpha interferons, is the affinity and potency of their interactions. And still at the protein level, um, there's very little certainly to functionally distinguish some of these alpha subtypes. The beta and epsilon uh, may be uh, a more readily distinguished by their function. So again, if you take a broader look and you're not really supposed to look at, to, to see much of that on the phylogeny of interferons, basically what you can see is, is the rows that you see, for example, up the top there in a species are all the alpha interferons. And so they group together in a species. So what it, it, there's a very short evolutionary time when you become a certain species then to, to, to be able to produce 15 interferon alpha genes for some reason. So one of the important things, thank you, seems to be just the diversity, being able to produce a lot of them. So that's amplified here where you can see the alpha genes in mouse and the alpha genes in human. So what you don't see is a relationship where there's a subtype of alpha in a mouse similar to a subtype of alpha in the human, which is what you would expect if you're conserving a separate function for these genes. In the case of beta and, in fact, epsilon, that relationship does exist. So mouse and human betas, wherever they are there, are more similar than they are to, to the alphas, for example. Same with this interferon epsilon. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, I've been invited back, fortunately, later in the year to give one of the Wednesday seminars. So I'll, I thought I'd save talks about the, the, the separate functions of these two proteins to that particular time and, and keep it more general, this one. So the other interesting thing is that if you look at the phylogeny of the promoters, they show a very similar relationship with the alphas clustered beta, epsilon, etc., separate to what you see in the protein coding genes. And in fact, if you look even more at this sort of colour map where the different colours represent different transcription factor binding sites, you actually see more diversity here in the promoters than you perhaps do in domains of the protein coding sequences. So there are, there are groups, a group of alphas here, for example, which are often made together that have this classic viral response element, which IRF7 sites. You can see the two genes up here, 1 and 13, which encode identical proteins, have very different looking promoters and are going to be made then at very different times. Um, down here you have, for example, interferon beta promoter, which has this typical and characteristic NF-kappa B and IRF3 neighbouring sites, which makes that the only interferon being produced uh, in response to LPS treatment. Uh, epsilon is there somewhere and doesn't have any recognition, recognisable pattern recognition sites, and in fact we've worked on that and found that it's hormone regulated. Um, as I said, that, that beta promoter has been worked over to death by many artists during the 18s as a classic example of, of what, how enhancers work with several positive regulatory domains, 
which subsequently turned out to, to be identified over the, over the time as containing IRF elements which bound IRF7 or IRF3, uh, NF-kappa-B elements, and also um, elements that will bind FOSS and June on AP1 sites to drive some of the physiological stimuli. So, so what we see here then in, is this diversity of promoters that's going to make at least some members of this gene family able to be produced under different circumstances. And, and you know, I'd put it to you that maybe that, in this case, case of a very unusual group of cytokines with redundant action through a single receptor, may, may well be the raison d'etre for this multi-gene family. So, you know, the hypothesis then is these upstream uh, signaling pathways, you know, sensing danger or viruses or bacteria by TLRs, rigged like helicases, a variety of DNA sensors, find different ways to activate IRF3 members, sometimes in the case of beta with NF-kappa B, but then that the promoters present a different range of elements to ensure that some of these or one of them or a group of them are going to be made in important circumstances. Um, okay, so, so perhaps then the interferon promoters provide properties to ensure that these very important interferon molecules are made in particular situations, whether it be cell or tissue specificity, a particular pathogen, or as I've mentioned, different physiological stimuli. Okay, so I'll, I'll go very briefly to just talk a little bit then about what are the properties of these interferons, and I'll just go in detail into one or two examples. But typ typically at a cell biological level, uh, obviously, as I've said to you, type 1 interferons and other interferons are defined by the fact that they can induce an antiviral state. But also they can regulate many different properties of cells. They can usually inhibit proliferation of many different cell types. They can be pro or anti-apoptotic depending on the cell context and the, the stimulus being applied. They can modify migration and they can modify activation status. In the case of the immune response, the cell biological mod modulations then mean that interferons can target most uh, effector cells of the uh, innate and adaptive immune response and modify both their generation as well as their activation and particular functions. Um, cl clinically, uh, all of this results in the fact that the utility of interferons have always been based on the fact that they can inhibit viral replication, potentially directly affect tumour tumor growth, but also to modulate immune responses to different stimuli. Uh, and the, the result has been that interferon is still, although it's probably fading out with the development of better uh, antiretrovirals, uh, antiviral compounds, uh, they've been used for chronic hep hepatitis B and C, and that's been operational for decades. Uh, certain hematological cancers respond very well to type 1 interferons. Multiple sclerosis for really unknown reasons seem to respond particularly to interferon beta and not the alphas, probably by modulating the immune response around the uh, degenerating nerve fibres. Um, in addition to these beneficial effects, interferon also has quite damaging effects. It, is a pro-inflammatory cytokine and can induce inflammation. Um, it's involved in autoimmunities, which was probably first noticed on people taking long-term chronic therapy that they started to develop symptoms of lupus. Uh, and indeed, in animal models, uh, you, you, can, you can reverse many of the symptoms of, of uh, particularly lupus in the models by crossing them to interferon receptor null mice. Uh, and interferon also is quite toxic. So the, the clinical efficacy has always been balanced by these, these, these uh, protective effects versus, versus damaging effects. To the, to the point where in SLE there are now clinical trials of interferon blockers to, to see if they can be particularly useful. Um, I thought I'd show one local example of the toxicity and, and we, I was lucky enough to collaborate with Warren Alexander and Robin Starr and um, Doug and so forth here in, in the early days of their work on SOX and the phenotype of the SOX1 knockout mice and SOX1 is a negative regulator of interferons and other uh, stat signaling or using cytokines. These mice die by the time of weaning of a toxicity that's really multi or you know, it results in multi-organ inflammation. So there's abnormalities of the thymus, hepatitis of the liver and lungs, pancreas, skin and so forth. Um, what was noticed was that this phenotype actually mimicked very old data when a guy called Ian Gresser was, had injected interferon gamma into neonatal mice. 
And so they crossed these mice with interferon gamma, gamma knockouts and found that you could essentially completely rescue this phenotype. As you can do at least this element of the phenotype by crossing them with interferon signaling null mice as well. So this is probably, I think, one of the most profound effects of the absolute toxicity of unlimited and unchecked uh, cytokine signaling, in this case by the interferons. Okay, so the next thing I'll move on to is, is perhaps to, to think, discuss a little bit about how these signals then are generated. Um, a lot of those biological effects of the interferons have been uh, brought, brought about by studies of interferon receptor null mice. So the fact that most all of these type 1 interferons have been characterised a signal through the, a common receptor complex has made it very simple to knock them out because instead of being able to, having to target one at a time, you can target the receptor complex and nullify the effects of all of those cytokines of this family member. So basically that showed what, what we knew in dramatic ways that, that these interferons are critical in viral infection. So if you don't have an interferon response in this survival curve, uh, mice die very quickly. Just before they die, if you look at viral replication, this is on a log scale. So organs can grow up to 10 logs of viral particles within 24 hours if you don't have this, which is a great uh, demonstration, I think, of, of the, the speed and power of this uh, immediate and early acting uh, direct antiviral system. Um, we also, in collaborative studies, use these mice, and many people have used them to show that interferons are important in, in the development of tumours. So um, the, the, the data here is from a collaboration with Mark, Slips, Mark Smith's lab, uh, who was then at the Peter Mac, who showed that this NK cell responsive tumour, so this is titrating tumour, looking at the day of tumour onset. So the wild type mice get lots of tumours at this time when these number of cells are injected. And various knockout mice can protect, not only the type 1 interferons, but those related to interferon gamma signaling and, and other effector molecules. But as you titrate down the number of cells to the point where even interferon gamma and perforin are no longer effective because these mice are developing tumours at the same rate as wild type, still the two interferon receptor knockouts or a neutralising antibody um, are effective, indicating in, in at least this model system that, that the type 1 interferon system is really critical uh, anti-tumour protection. And, and various groups of people, particularly Mark himself in collaboration with Bob Schreiber, have shown, done many elegant studies of, of the both type 1 and type 2 interferon and STAT signaling to show that in the various stages as they classified of uh, elimination, equilibrium and editing of a tumour's existence uh, with its uh, associated immune response, that interferon impacts on various cells of the innate and adaptive immune response are very important. So the interferon signals that, that disseminate these various effects, as, as we've said, are, are modified by all the ligands and mediated through these IFNA1 and IFNA2 receptor components. Like most cytokines, these come constitutively docked with an associated JAK kinase, which on bringing together with the ligand to form a ternary complex, phosphorylate each other in the receptor. Stat molecules come in and dock and move off as usually dimers. As I, as I mentioned earlier, the classic usually associated with type 1 interferon is this ISG, ISGF3 complex of STAT1 and 2 with an IRF9 or P48 molecule recognises particular elements upstreams of promoters and drives a set of genes. But really, if you look in, in different situations of interferon stimulation of different types of cells, you can see various dimers of STAT1 and 3, which are often associated with uh, gamma signalling, STAT5, STAT4 and STAT6 as well. So depending on the cell context, you know, there are many different types of STAT-dependent signalling and therefore many gene programs that are going to be going to be regulated, and non-STAT signalling as well. So, so this, this signalling complex is very, very, very complex. And what I thought I might do uh, is just have a couple of slides to talk about what's known about antiviral effectors, seeing that is the definitive and classic interferon signalling. 
So we've known for a long time, and one of the great things about working in interferon, as I, say, I said, is some of the interferon-induced genes were identified decades ago. The STAT system was discovered there. So we've always had tools and been very lucky to be able to dissect the molecular aspects of signaling. So e examples of early antiviral effectors, for example, uh, it was known that uh, this gene, oligo 25 oligoadenylate synthetase, is an antiviral molecule. So it's interferon inducible. It actually catalyzes the conversion of molecules of ATP into oligomers of adenylate. But instead of the normal 3,5, they have this 2 prime, 5 prime structure, which gives it an unusual kinky structure. That structure means it can activate a latent ribonuclease, uh, RNAs L, which, which actually then has a specificity for degradation of viral RNA. Both the OAS and the RNAs L are dependent on double-stranded RNA, so they have to bind double-stranded RNA from a virus, for example, in order to be active, even though the, the gene and the protein products are induced by interferon. A similar situation exists for protein kinase R, which is another double-stranded RNA-dependent molecule. It um, phosphorylates the protein initiation factor EIF2-alpha, which once activated actually inhibits protein synthesis. Other genes include ADAR, which is a, uh, an RNA editing enzyme, the MX protein, which was discovered because of its uh, ability to inhibit flu in virus, uh, very recently published in Nature, I think earlier this year or late last year, to be active on HIV, uh, is uh, involved in, in GTP generation and, and inhibits viral uh, transcription and nuclear transport. So what this gives you the flavour of is, this is an example of four genes, protein effector molecules that interferon can induce that can impact on viral replication at specific pathways. And in a broad context, interferons have been shown to be um, able to stop with different viruses, essentially every stage of viral repli uh, infection and replication from attachment, entry, replication, transcription, translation, budding and so forth. Not always for all viruses. They seem to have uh, particular mechanisms that are specific to different types of viruses. So I, 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 I thought I'd, I'd show you what I think is one of the most impressive uh, pieces of work that, uh, that's come out in understanding interferon's antiviral effect. And it was a, the first papers from Charlie Rice's group at the Rockefeller by a postdoc called John Shoggins. And I thought this was done by a team of people, but John told me this was his, his PhD in this place. So basically what he did was set up a reporter system to screen for antiviral molecules that might mediate interferon's effects. And the, in these days where we can look at interferon-regulated genes in microarrays, he came up with a, a group of, I think, 500 to 350 uh, interferon-stimulated genes he was going to test set up a, a system where the, so he cloned all of these 350, put them in a system where there was an IRS driving, I think, a red fluorescent protein so that you could transfect cells, red colour meant they were expressing the ISG, then transfected them with a GFP labelled virus. So essentially, by flow, you could look at in viral infection, uh, and the green there is, is showing viral infected cells. If the protein is expressed, so you can gate on cells that express the protein and the virus. If the ISG is antiviral, you will get less green, as shown here. If it's in fact uh, stimulatory, you can get an increase in the number. So that way, as, as you can see down the bottom there, he set up screens for numerous viruses. In this second paper was published, uh, is that th this year or last year? I can't remember. Uh, in nature anyway, and basically they've now screened about 14 different viruses for 350 affected genes. This, uh, the data is gathered around this midpoint here where there is no change and the red line there is their statistical cutoff. So for each virus, essentially what they've come up with is a set of, of interferon-induced antiviral genes of the affector molecules. And some of these are culprits that we know of, like IRF7, the MX protein is there, IRF1, which had one of the earliest induced interferon regulatory molecules that had really lost favour, and it's come up as being really important in, in a lot of these different situations. So there are some known culprits and some, some very new culprits that have, that have come up here. And basically for, for broadly interactions or for specific viruses, you can come up with a hierarchy of, of molecules uh, 
I mean, the latest one in this last paper, this C6 or 150, is now called CGAS, which is a cyclic GMP AMP synthetase. So basically, it senses DNA or RNA viruses, and the enzyme then convert produces, generates from from that a ligand for some of the PAMPs and stimulates interferon production that way. So. You know, in, in global approaches to, to, to responses these days, you can see you can make great inroads to identifying particular uh, effector molecules for one of, the, one of the biological outputs of the interferon response. Um, so I, I guess these days um, it's true to say that this family of interferon genes which uh, are going to be produced in response, stimula in response to stimulation of a number of different pattern recognition receptor families, multiple signaling pathways, whether they're stat mediated or not stat mediated, are going to uh, basically generate a group of genes. And you know, microarray studies have told us that the number of genes induced, you know, from study to study, might be 300, 800, uh, several thousand, and. What I'm going to talk about for the last uh, 15 minutes or so is some of the work we, we've undertaken to try and understand, you know, the different pathways, what gene sets they're responsible for, and how this can mediate the various interferon effects, like those antiviral genes that seem to be, you know, perhaps coordinately made to target a particular virus. So remembering that the consequence, you know, we want is, you know, a return to homeostasis, whatever the stimulus we're responding to, uh, protective immunity to develop. Uh, if this is out of tune, then we're going to get toxicity, you know, infection, autoimmunity if it's, if it's deregulated for long periods of time. So basically, you know, I, I look at it like, you know, soundboard from my, my son's band, essentially. So, you know, our signaling pathways rep are represented by all these different channels. So if everything's ramped up, you're just going to get blasted with noise, which will deafen your sound horrible. Uh, if it's all ramped down, you get nothing, there's no response, and that's useful. So, you know, it's the careful tuning of each one of these that are going to give you the absolute perfect outcome to, to deal with situations just the way we want. So a few years ago uh, in our group, uh, a postdoc called Shamath Samarajua set up a database called the Interferome, which what we thought we would do in order to get the broadest view of interferon signaling was take every microarray we could find in, in the public domain where you know, a mouse, a human, a cell had been treated with any interferon and you know, large-scale microarrays done and put it in a database. We collected, basically what this says, it's a relational database we kept on each ISG interferon regulated gene, and they're not all stimulated. There are as many repressed genes as there are stimulated ones. We collected all the information we could about the protein, the domains of the protein. We looked at their regulatory regions. We collected you know, homologs across 40 species to try and look at conserved conservation, particularly in, um, in regulatory regions to infer function. Put in some sort of functionalities where you could map it onto chromosomes or map the ISGs down here onto the NIH tissue expression panel and, and basically use that to try and develop an annotation of this interferon response. We subsequently updated it and published it last year, so uh, you can Google it and find it or look at the publication in Nucleic Acids Research Database Edition. Um, so this is an example. I'll, so I'll go through one example of the sort of things we would like to be able to do with it and what we're starting to do. So this, this is a dendrogram of the regulatory elements in, uh, of, of all the, of, well, this is a, a snapshot of some ISGs in there. And, and the pattern that, that emerges is, is that there are linkages. And, and what I would like to imagine is that perhaps these subgrouping are going to represent co-regulated genes that may have uh, a particular function that may contribute to these antivirals like the 350 we just saw screened or different uh, effects of the interferons. So the, the, the question is, can you take a subset and essentially work up and down uh, this list depending on which way you're approaching? So can you take a gene set, you know, identify a pathway and our way to identify pathways is through promoter elements you know, downstream to biological function, look at its role in pathology, you know, can you identify biomarkers or sets of genes that are signatures and infer therapeutic responses. 
Um, so, so this sort of thing you can now do now in this latest edition of, of, of the database. So you can take you know, a microarray of any experiment you want, blast it there and it'll tell you how many regulated genes and then you can work your way around it. So the example I, I'll give you is a collaboration with Belinda Parker who was at that, th that time at the Peter Mac, is now up at La Trobe at the LIMS Institute, who did this uh, lovely model uh, of 4T1.2. It, it, so it's a syngenetic model of a mammary tumour which is implanted into the mammary fat pattern of a mouse. This particular subline of the tumour spontaneously metastasizes, particularly to bone, which is obviously one of the major problem, problems with, in women with breast cancer, but also to lung and other organs. But this, this is essentially a bone metastasis story. Um, so basically what she did was, those uh, circles are out of whack, but uh, isolated um, the carcinomatous epithelial cells from the primary tumour, from, from away from everything else, and, and also from bone, did an affimetrix microarray on them and compared them. So what she found that there were over 2,000 differentially regulated genes, noticed some IRGs and thankfully approached us for a collaborative study. So basically what we found, this is a microarray that you're probably used to seeing, you know, yellow, yellow's unchanged, red's high, blue is low. And on the left, going from the left, there are four tracks that represent examples of primary tumours. The next four ex examples of, um, of, of the met metastases. So what stands out is this block of, uh, of blue lines down in the bottom corner amplified up here. So what this represents is a set of genes that are repressed in the metastases compared to their expression in the primary tumour. And there are 2,000 521 of those. So we blasted them against the interferome genes at the time and found that there were 540 genes in there that were repressed in metastases that are interferon regulated genes. And this is pretty surprising because there really wasn't much story or any indication that you know, interferon intrinsically within metastasizing tumor cells had a role. So we, we essentially looked at promoter enrichment analysis and found that these genes showed a, a dramatic enrichment for IRF7 binding sites. Uh, and that's just a snapshot of them. Just to give you an idea that some genes have lots of them, some genes have one, have one or two. Um, so Shamath and Sam Forster, a student in the lab, developed a really nice workflow to, to streamline this, this type of approach, we, which we can do now uh, quickly and, and pretty automate automate in an automated fashion and used both a combination of publicly available and now some homemade uh, transcription factor binding site analysis programs to, to hone those elements down. So basically what it said was that IRF7 regulated genes were repressed during the process of metastases. So in, um, we then went to look for IRF7 itself and confirmed that its expression w w was reduced. So not only uh, the regulated genes down, but this master regulator, if you can call it that, is also reduced. So this shows immunohistochemistry of the primary tumour and the bone. You can see a dramatic reduction in the protein levels. Also reduced in lung, but never, it always shows an intermediate phenotype between the primary and bone. The tumours are actually tagged with colour, so you can actually easily measure uh, the, uh, the, the tumour cells, uh, the RF7 expression in tumour, sorry. That's not that. This is IRF7 by PCR in the black lines in the primary tumour and in the white or absent in the metastases. So, you know, this gene and protein are pretty much repressed. I mean, what I'm not going to give you an answer to is why this gene is on in the first place and what's the mechanism of, of its loss of expression. So the model we set out, and excuse this sort of simplistic diagrams I came up with, was that in the primary tumour, the black represents the presence of IRF7. This is going to uh, activate the expression of a number of genes. Some of these will be secreted, and the hypothesis was that this acted on the host immune system, and basically the immune response blocked metastases. If IRF7 was lost, somewhere, and we don't know where, whether it's during escape of a metastatic cell from the primary, during transmit or lodgment of bone. But if the IRF7 is lost, then you no longer get this product, you no longer get immune activation. The, the first step in that hypothesis was to basically put IRF7 back in under a retrovirus, under a system where it couldn't be lost, and ask if you prevented uh, bone metastases, and the answer is you did. This is done several ways. This is measuring fluorescently labelled tumour cells, so there's a significant reduction uh, 
uh, in the metastatic site. This is an immuno where in the, uh, in, in the normal situation you can see these large tumour cells in the bone marrow, often in big clusters. They're really difficult to find in any of those large clusters uh, in the presence of RF7 and you have a normal uh, hemopoietic uh, composition of the bone marrow there. And also you get a an extension, a significant extension in metastases-free survival. So this, this experiment's done where you let the primary tumour grow up, you excise it, and then survival is dependent on the growth of metastases uh, in the various organs. Next question we asked was whether host immune response was, resp was important for this effect, and the answer is it was. So if you use nod-skid gamma mice here without the immune cells, uh, the mice die quicker, but also there is no difference between uh, the base vector and the IRS7 vector transfected cells by, by any of the parameters and I'll just show you the two of survival and the uh, histology of, of the bone marrow here. We next asked whether what are the critical effector cells, and after many depletions, the best example is shown here in survival. We found that a combination of NK cells and CD8 cell depletion, you can see here in the blue line, had a, had a significant uh, effect on, on survival. Next thing we asked, since IRF7 drives interferon production, whether interferon may be uh, contribute one of the important effector molecules. So we did this experiment in IFNAR1 null mice and found that indeed it was. So again, you can see no difference between the base vector and IRF7, which is the straight and dotted lines, and the mice in the IFNAR null um, essentially die quicker. And if Similarly, if you look at the histology of the bone marrow in that time, uh, it backs up that support as does measurement of the tumours. So essentially, the host immune system is important, um, IRF7 is important, uh, and the effector cells, as I said, is NK and CD8 cells. So what? Well, one of the things uh, we, we, th we thought of then as to how this might be useful, particularly in, a, in the human setting, IRF7, occupy, like many molecules, I guess, occupies an interesting position in, as I said, it's, ups, it's activated by the uh, pattern recognition receptor system to drive interferon production, but it is also itself an interferon-regulated gene. So like many of these factors, there seems to be a circuitous sort of autocrine loop driving their production. So the question was, rather than IRF7, can you just treat with interferon and drive the pathway and get rescue? And the answer is, yes, you can. So this graph here reminds me to say that none of what I've told you has any impact on primary tumour growth. The primary tumour growth is not affected by this system, it's just the process of metastases. So whether you look in vivo or in vitro, there's no effect of interferon or IRF7 on primary tumour growth. If you measure tumour cells, there's a dramatic reduction in response to inter interferon, uh, normalisation of the histology and a significant prolongation in survival time. We then did some work to see if we could, we could see this situation through, uh, also existed in, in women with tumours. So we had a few examples shown here of matched primary and bone metastases. You can see there's a, a dramatic reduction in IRF7 expression in these four examples. Um, if we look at the signature and we refine the resignature down to a smaller number of cells, I can go into it later if people are interested, but there was a significant correlation of the presence uh, of this IRF7 six, uh, signature with um, fewer bone metastases and longer term survival here. So I think what, what this shows you is that this sort of approach of, of trying to look at gene signatures in a large way, and I guess this has done a lot in the, in the cancer setting, less in our settings of innate immunity and infectious diseases. But you know, there are some, some legs, I think, in, in some credibility in the idea that using this sort of approach, we can annotate this interferon system and find groups of genes that may have be co-regulated by particular factors and offer, offer ways of manipulation. So I guess I'll finish up there. So hopefully if you take home little else from this talk, it's that interferons are an important family of uh, immunoregulatory cytokines. Um, they're a large family of molecules that act uh, in a very channeled way through, through one receptor system of IFNAR1 and 2 in the in the example of the type 1s, signal via JAK-STAT, but also other signaling pathways. The family is 
generated a diversity of regulatory elements which I think are very important in ensuring that some of these proteins are produced and you get some of that response. And the decades of study on if non null mice where none of these proteins can signal are a testament to the importance of this in many immune responses. Interferons do act locally, uh, as I think you've had some examples of, but they can act in an autocrine manner on the cell, making them on the next door cell, but you often see them particularly in acute infections systemically. So it, it has the ability to operate over different systems. But often, I guess in the old days, if people wanted to know interferon was involved in a situation, uh, you, you look to measure interferon, whether it's in your cell culture, in your mouse serum or your human serum. And indeed, some cases, some times you can find it. But often you can't because, you know, think, uh, factors that act in an autocrine or paracrine are often produced locally and are, are difficult to detect. Now, I think that's where um, you know, lo looking at gene signatures, and I guess we're much advanced from the old days of 10 years ago where you'd look at one or two or three interferon regulated genes. Now you can look at whole sets of them. Uh, and you know, there are ways, not only in this system, but I think in many other systems, to start annotating these genes into pathways so that we can, um, we can find out their role in disease. So certainly interferon signatures uh, as I've discussed today, we found in situation in breast cancer metastases, which was unexpected. I mean, we, there's been little work to, to foreshadowing that, that that would have indicated to us that, you know, an innate response driven by IRF7 and making interferon is operational in you know, memory epithelial cells when they turn tumorigenic. Um, but you also see signatures like this in lupus, which has, has led to the, or contributed to consolidating the idea that interferons may have some role in the pathology there and, and that uh, blocking antibodies may be useful. Signatures have been found in mycobacterium tuberculosis that's led to studies of the role using knockout mice, at least in mouse models that have been confirmed, and chronic viral infections where, again, you can see particular subsets of, of signatures doing interesting things. Um, all right, so I'll leave it there and happily answer questions. Thanks for your attention. therapeutics are around the type 1s and not interferon gamma. Do we not try and either provide or block interferon gamma because of the historical context of the interferons or is it too dangerous? Or I just wonder if you could give me some insight yeah. as to why people it, 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 it probably is historic, I think. So, you know, if you go back to the 80s when people had recombinant proteins and so you're now not so much talking science, but you're talking a company with shareholders and, and the money and the efficacy and the efficiency of doing things count, right? So I think um, there are toxicity issues with gamma and I think, again, those sox mice are a, a great example, at least in a mouse, if humans are the same as to how toxic it can be. And I is think that... There's not a lot of proof of that. I mean, it's, no. it's not a nice thing to take for people with immunosuppression, but it doesn't seem to have... It doesn't seem to drive autoimmunity in man, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm not on top of that li literature totally, but my understanding is, is that it is... It, it has had toxicity issues, if, if you look at some of the early clinical trials, and I think that just essentially put people off. So nowadays, if you could deliver that more systemically or look at it, locally or in a targeted way, it, it may well be more effective. So that's kind of a speculative answer, I guess. Um, I'm interested in the role of the antibacterial response. So <coughs> when you look at the effect of genes that are regulated by the type 1 interferon, they all look very, very antiviral, uh, very slanted RNA, blah, blah, blah. What, what genes are regulated so I, I, I hate it if I've left you with that impression. So I, I guess depending on your stats, you, you could say in that in that database there are 3,000 you know, interferon regulated genes, and there are probably now with John Shoggin's work, you know, dozens of proven antiviral genes. So there's another couple of thousand genes that do all sorts of things from you know, impact on metabolism. So. You know, if you, if you look at um, antibacterial effectors, it can regulate antibacterial peptides, uh, oxidative stress redox molecules, INOS, um, and, and also, so it, it can be antibacterial, but it, uh, depending on 
the nature of the bacterial infection. Uh, it can also exacerbate you know, bacterial infection. So it, it can essentially go either way. And it probably depends whether it's having a, a direct effect through some of those effector molecules or modulating a particular aspect of the immune response. I think. So with the, uh, <laughs> All up to you, John. <laughs> Um, you, you didn't mention the interferonopathies. Uh, no, and I think it is, again, I'm a little bit out of my league there. My understanding is that the, the DNA might be one of the things that Yeah, I kind of think I alluded to it a bit. So the, the best characterised one is um, a Cardi Gutierrez syndrome, which is yep. a neurological syndrome that affects uh, young, young kids uh, and, and, and is lethal. And that's due to mutations in. DNA, well, DNAs and RNAs, TREX is, is one of the molecules, there's a mouse model of that. And essentially the idea is that, yeah, you know, DNA you get from, from damaged cells is not degraded by nucleases, so essentially mimics an, an infection. Um, certainly, you know, in mouse models you can reverse that, the, the, that pathology with crossing with it, no, not that nice. Yeah. Um, and, and that did lead me on to the next question. <coughs> DNA is a nice damp for, for production of interference. But what about uh, some of these other sort of necrotonic damps? Do you know any more about uh, that? Whether they also good inducers? No, I mean, almost by the, by the month we're finding new, well, either new types of DNA or nucleotides or, you know, that, that, that can generate a PAMP, right? I mean, C gas is the latest one that came yeah. out last years that, that can just use up DNA or an RNA as, as a substrate and, and make a different damp. There are other examples of, of enzymes that will do that. So, you know, just an emerging field, I think. And there's another question? There's another one there. <laughs> okay, um, just to save you from John. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if I'm interpreting your metastases data correctly, <clears throat> systemic interferon is basically acting away from the site of the primary tumor, is that right? No, we don't know that. So or, or I think we know that the, well, that interferon is produced and acts on, if you like, a host cell. We, I don't think we can distinguish whether that immune cell might be, you know, at the site, well, it could be a stromal cell, you know, it could be an immune cell at the primary site, could be during transition, could be cells in the bone marrow when, when the metastatic cell is lodged in there, so. So I suppose that's my, uh, my question. Have you tried, uh, you know, allowing metastases to occur and take hold in the bone marrow and then treating with interferon? Does that have any effect? Um, we haven't actually done that. No. Um, with your interferon up, um, alpha is with your phylum DNA tree. Are there a lot of sort of processed pseudo interferon alpha like pseudogenes lying around in a lot of the genomes? Because it seems a bit strange that humans and mice and all these other ones would all develop their family of genes uh, seemingly independently, with, whereas if you had multiple. Yeah. Just, yeah. Not sure if I'm following the question. Sorry, <laughs> keep going. <laughs> so it's essentially of, of that is that tree indicating a single source or sort of an intermediate family in ancestral spe species of which a one of those genes in that family is, for example, dominated in humans, and then you've got your eight of those in humans, or is it? So is there a sort of common ancestral pre Or is it, is is it multiple what? common ancestors coming from So, there? So certainly as far back, back as you go in vertebrates, you get multiple type 1 interferons. You don't get as many. You don't get 20 genes there. There's a handful of genes, uh, but more than one. That answers the question. OK. Um, we used up all the time, so just remain to thank Paul for a very great event.